Welcome to the Be Well Network program. I'm Dr. Ted Bender, clinical psychologist and CEO of the Be Well Network. My goal in this program is to educate the public about mental health awareness. Today, I am ecstatic to interview and have on Katie Sullivan, who, in addition to being an actress and a producer, is a USA record holder and Paralympian. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to have this conversation. So you've had a very intriguing life and a very interesting story, and I'm, I'm dying to learn more about you as we go. But I'm curious how you became um, first involved in mental health advocacy and what inspired you to use your platform as an athlete to promote this cause. I mean, I, I guess, honestly, for, just for your listeners, a little bit of background to myself. Um, I am a bilateral above-the-knee uh, amputee. So I am, um, uh, what that means is I'm missing both of my legs from right above where my knees would be down. And um, that was from birth. So my mom had a normal pregnancy. There was nothing to indicate that there was something different about me. Um, and then it was when she was in labor that that this was revealed, <laughs> like all was revealed. So um, for me, my um, experience in life has always kind of been one of other, a one of not fitting in quite exactly, um, always feeling like I didn't have um, peers necessarily around me. I didn't know anyone who else who was uh, an amputee unless they were, you know, uh, sitting in a, a wheelchair at a hospital. So, you know, just no one in my actual like universe um, so honestly, the first time that I ever even uh, got involved with traditional therapy was once I became an athlete. Hmm. And that wasn't until um, I was in my 20s. Interesting. So I spent the majority of my childhood, my young adulthood, my adolescence, um, try, kind of what I would call practicing the art of blending in. Mm -hmm. So I would wear cosmetic covers to cover up the the prosthetic prosthesis that I was wearing I would wear I always wore pants even if it was I grew up in Alabama and it would be you know 103 degrees outside and I'd wear jeans because I just didn't have the confidence or um the where with you know the the confidence to to expose sort of what I felt were my secrets, my, um, my insecurities, obviously, at the end of the day. Um, and so it was when I was handed a pair of running blades hmm. to try that you cannot put any sort of pair of pants on a running blade um, <laughs> to make it look like you have, you know, natural anatomical legs um, that I really had to learn how to cope with and and confront and deal with my insecurities about my body how i was born and what i have to deal with on a on a daily basis um and it was through sport that made me kind of take that leap take that jump because i knew i was never going to be able to accomplish what i wanted to accomplish as an athlete if i was continuing to try to hide everything about me how old were you when you were handed those those running blades? I had never run before in my life yeah. uh, until I was 25. So it was actually there was this whole process for me of just learning how to put one foot in front of sure. the other in a in a quick fashion um, because I had no muscle memory uh -huh. for running. So I mentally understood like, okay, this is running like. I've, I've seen people run, but um, being able to sort of have the confidence to kind of quickly put one foot in front of the other when you've spent your entire life being afraid to fall yeah. um, was a big kind of mental hurdle to overcome, but also um, one that, you know, you're starting something you have never done before at the age of 25. Um, and Paralympics and sprinting and all of that was not even on the, t it wasn't even in my mind as something that was possible. Yeah. It was, um, I was, you know, at the time I was an actress um, and 
I, I still was sort of in this place of like, how do I blend in with everybody else? How do I go get acting jobs where there aren't opportunities for performers with disabilities out there? How do I kind of keep this as my little secret that I have? Um, and, uh, and, and in actuality, owning mm -hmm. who I am, everything about me has opened more doors hmm. than I could possibly have imagined. That's interesting. I want to back up a little bit. You know, you mentioned a little bit about childhood and growing up and some of the insecurities. I mentioned it must have felt pretty isolative at times. And then you mentioned um, therapy kind of later in life when um, you were into sport. What, what drove you to seek out mental health help and what was the primary reason? I honestly, I had so much anxiety around competing Yeah, okay. because I had never, uh, I, I, I was not a, comp I, even saying the word athlete was incredibly challenging for me. Mm -hmm. I would sort of be like, yeah, I run a little bit like, and then when you're in an international competition, <laughs> like if people want to call you an athlete, you have to start wrapping your mouth around that word, um, with confidence and saying, no, I. I am an athlete. It doesn't matter when you start being something. It's just, can you own that you are, you know, to some extent. Um, but it was our, we had the Paralympic team mm -hmm. had a team psychologist. Gotcha. Got you. And um, I was having all of this anxiety around competing and I'm a performer. I mean, I grew up singing I grew up acting. Yeah. I'd been on, at that point I had been on major network television shows and uh, I, I show up for a track meet and I am, I am, I have so much anxiety. I'm riddled with this anxiety that I, there were even times, there was a time that for my first ever national championship, I turned to my prosthetist who builds prosthetic legs. Um, and I said, can I just sing the national anthem? <laughs> like I would <laughs> rather, I would rather sing the national anthem to all of these people here than run this race which um, I know for most people, public speaking is is one of those things that is like higher than death yeah. on, the, uh -huh. on, the, on the scale, You're the Richter right. scale of like <laughs> bad. Um, so that wasn't my problem. My problem was having the, the confidence and perhaps even the confidence in that part of my body that I never relied upon mm. in those, in that kind of way. That's interesting, yeah. Um, I wonder in, in your story, which is, is, is absolutely fascinating, it actually kind of makes sense. I, I have a friend who's an actor, debilitating anxiety, but he can go and, and do um, auditions and be in shows and movies. He's fine. You'd never know it in a million years. Outside of that, can barely leave the house sometimes. So you're yeah. in a similar situation where you're very comfortable in the spotlight and acting, um, but this this new part of your life you were struggling a lot, not just because it was something new, but you were lacking confidence in that part of your body almost and the ability to carry uh, you. Right. Absolutely. That's very interesting. So it was through, um, through the Par U.S. Paralympic team and through that, uh, our team psychologist that I really started to figure out, you know, ways uh, to, to almost kind of think about them in the same way box yeah. so thinking about sport in the same way that i think about acting hmm. and and it's sort of a bit of like fake it till you make it yeah. so like putting yourself in a position um where you kind of remove yourself from the place that makes you anxious and think about the places what do you do in those situations where you feel confident hmm. and kind of use that same sort of um mentality to approach so i actually started approaching competition and being an athlete as like playing a character who is an athlete huh. like how would i behave how would i if this was a scene in a movie and we could do it again like if we could um you know you'd you'd still want to like hit your hit your marks and like you know dot all the i's and cross all the t's but um if you can if i could think about it in a way and in a field of of life where I feel confident was this beautiful little trick that we figured out how to 
how to to help boost my confidence until I could just show up and and compete and perform. It's the same. The, acting and sports are the exact same in my mind. There is a set. There are costumes. Mm-hmm. There's lights. There's you know you have blocking. There is. It is. It is all just performative. And if you can take your press the pressure off yourself mentally, that's when you can get into a zone where you can do your best. That's pretty brilliant. And um, hats off to the work that you did there and also of that psychologist. Sounds like he really knew what he was doing. She, she, she was awesome. She. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Uh, something you said earlier. I, I'm I, One piece I'm still a little fuzzy on. How do you go from not being an athlete all this years in your life till someone hands you this new technology or old technology or just new for you, you put these on and now you're in the Paralympics. Like how did, how did you tell me about that process a little bit? That that's fascinating in and of itself. Like how did that happen? So there was many steps, but I have to say, um, the first one was, uh, we just, we were just going to, I had to get over the hurdle of, not blending in. I had to get over yeah. that hurdle of everyone is going to glance in my direction and and make opinions, assumptions, have thoughts about my life, who I am, mm-hmm. what I have going on. They're either going to be feeling something like impressed or sad or um and so how do I enter into a situation where I am confronted by all of these mental challenges that that come with Mm -hmm. sort of people noticing you people staring at you um and that really started with a support system a team you know my prosthetist and you know his assistant and some friends we signed up for a 5k and it was just like i i literally didn't own a pair of shorts at that point like i had to go buy (laughs) a pair of shorts to like (laughs) go be out in public this way yeah and I remember sitting in the car and just being so terrified to open this car door and step out into the world and in this way that I have never had the confidence to do ever, ever, ever. Um, so it, it was that support system of people being like, let's try it. If you hate it, we'll mm-hmm. leave. Like you, we don't have to finish. It's just a little plastic metal anyway. It doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, um, and that slowly started to um, transition to what if we went to a track meet? Mm-hmm. And um, it was actually at my first track meet um, that I met a Paralympic track coach. And, um, you know, he came up to me and huh. was very excited and animated and just like, how serious about this are you? And I was like, not at all, sir. <laughs> <laughs> just, just not at all. <laughs> so, um, but I think what he did was sort of plant a seed of possibility. And, um, and what I didn't realize at the time is that there were no, uh, no bilateral above the knee amputees had made it to uh, international competition um, at that point. So he was so excited because he was like, let's do it. Let's yeah. be the first to do this. Like let's. And, um, and it was sort of that, uh, that seed of possibility that he planted in my brain. And it, and it, it came at a point where the, possibility of failure and the possibility of what you could gain the, it, it was worth it to try yeah it was worth putting myself in a position of failing um to say this is possible so why not try the worst thing the worst thing that could happen is i get in great shape i learn a new skill yeah. i meet new people i do all these things and i don't make a u.s team right like that to me was worth sticking myself, my neck out in a way that I had never done before because the possibility of uh, not winning, but the possibility of having success was more exciting to me than the fear of what that failure might look like. 
That's very interesting. Um, you just on a personal note, you've inspired my young son. I, I've been uh, I've been researching you all week and uh, showing him videos and stuff and telling him. About nice. You. He's ten. He just ran his first five k uh, a couple weeks ago. He finished first in his age group and uh, 40th overall. Was, uh, so he was really proud of himself. Wow. So, yeah. So my question to you is, what was the time on your first 5K? Do you remember? Oh, gosh. <laughs> probably an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> like, it was probably, they're like, we're not, we're not running a marathon here. Um, it was very slow. But, like, that is not what I got out of that yeah, day. Yeah, you know, yeah, what I yeah. got out of that day was exposure exposure yep. and, and what i learned from that specific mm -hmm. day was being vulnerable yep. um which was so terrifying it was so terrifying that that vulnerability mm -hmm. actually seemed to be helping other people yeah. like people would be like cheering and actually there were people that would come up to, came up to me at the end um, saying, I saw you at mile two when I was walking and I started jogging. <laughs> so, and so I think, um, I think that if you can get a sense of who you could possibly be in the world for other people, yeah. um, that can also be part of the fulfillment, the, the fulfilling part of, of putting yourself out there and taking a step outside of your comfort zone because you have no idea how you're in. I'm sure I impacted plenty of people that day, that day that didn't say anything to me. Um, and, uh, and that is a reward in itself. Yeah. As a, as a psychologist, I think it's important for our listeners um, and viewers to understand a, a really important point here. This is something that you feared tremendously. You didn't own a pair of shorts. You had to buy a pair of shorts for this 5K. Not only that, but then you had to get out into an environment where you were exposed in a way that you always avoided. Yet you got the courage to do that. I'm sure you had some support behind you to do that. And oftentimes, and correct me if I'm wrong in your story here, oftentimes when we talk about this, and I mentioned the word exposure, because you had to mm -hmm. eventually expose yourself to your fear, right? Oftentimes, mm -hmm. the thoughts and the distorted thinking that leads up to it is way, way worse than the actual event. Would you agree with that in that scenario specifically? A hundred, a hundred percent. Because I think we build up in our minds, uh, we have these stories that we tell ourselves how yeah. things are going to go yeah. or how things, how, what our experience is going to be well before we have any knowledge or like, tangible ex life experience of mm -hmm. that is what's going to be the outcome. Exactly. Um, and I don't know that I could have, if I had shown up that day by myself, I don't know if I would have gotten out of the car. Yeah. I really, I really don't know that I would have. And so I, it, it does take having, you know, finding that support system, having people who, even if it's, you know, a text chain with your friends, if you're far away from people, mm -hmm. or even if it's, you know, posting something on social media or something like that where you have support, but also some sort of accountability yep. because there is a, a bit to it that all these people showed up for me. So <laughs> I can't just, I mean, we could have gone home that day, but I would have, I, I sort of it, inadvertently had sort of set myself up to be accountable yeah, to the people who showed up for me. That was smart. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit, and um, I've I've had the the real the privilege of of speaking to a lot of professional athletes on this show, and one thing I've always been kind of really um, curious about is mental health in professional athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. An example, I got to speak with John Sally, four time NBA basketball champion, and he he was a you know he was a big star back in the '80s and the '90s, and he was a Detroit Piston when I lived in Detroit, so it was a just a great interview and. Um, he was telling me about, you know, you think from an outside perspective, at least I do, and I know a lot of people do, mm -hmm. to reach the levels that you and other professional athletes have gotten to, like, you got to be headstrong, mentally, physically disciplined, training constantly, putting aside so many things in life, like parties or celebrations or going out with friends, because you're up at five in the morning, 
running right. 10 miles, you know, before most people have even had breakfast, right? Right. And that's always fascinating to me. And I've, I've I always, you know, been really, I have a lot of admiration for people that have that level of dedication. So in my mind, in a lot of people's minds, how could any anyone doing that kind of thing have any kind of mental health problems at all? Like, how could you live that lifestyle and be dealing with, like, clinical depression or bipolar disorder? You know, uh, he was saying in the NBA there was guys like that all, all over the league. I, I've always had a hard time understanding how those two things came together. You've explained it in a way that, you know, you kind of just dealt with it head on. You got the help when you needed to get the help. You had the support group. You faced your fears. And you rose to an, a level that still is just amazing to me. I think... Um... The one caveat I would have to say from my perspective is that I didn't seek out the 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 opportunity for uh, therapy was available to yeah. me, you and still took that's it, though. why. Yeah, you took it. But I took it. I yeah. did take that mm -hmm. step. But I think um, I think being an athlete is such a it's such an interesting world of the focus is so much on the outcome. Yeah, and I think. I mean, it's either, you know, the clock that's that's ticking down or the number of baskets that you've gotten or the yardage that you've run. And um, there, it's so tangible that I think that um, those kinds of things, those goals that people can set for themselves, you just kind of go, yeah, tick, made it, tick, made it. But then where your the other parts of anxiety and depression and things can creep in mm -hmm. in the other stuff that's going on. Um, and people get burnt out. I mean, it gets hard, yeah. if you, especially you're also putting yourself in a position of being every time you step on the play of in the field of play, you are opening yourself up to the possibility of injury uh -huh. every single time. Now, don't you can't think about that all the time, but you, you know, that's a piece of it. And like when you're, um, your who you are as a person is wrapped up in what you can physically attain with your body um there becomes a lot of pressure to to perform and yeah. pressure to show up and be the you know be the goat like that's um i think that's everybody you know everybody's wanting to sort of catch that golden ring in some way um so for me it's a question of uh trying to do other things yeah. like things way outside of um of my field of play swim you know what i yeah. mean like there were things there were days where i had to take myself out of uh the constant uh hamster wheel of focusing on 100 meters is a straight line yeah. like the it's you can get uh, you can get tunnel vision and you can focus so so much on these these things that you were doing that taking yourself out of your comfort zone in terms of, of your, your discipline. And I mean, take a pottery class, <laughs> like do something totally outside of what you're used to doing, um, where you are not focused on the outcome. Mm -hmm. I think those kinds of activities where you're like, well, I, I don't have to be the fastest in America because you know, I'm this, I'm not, I'm not the fastest swimmer in America. So it takes that pressure off of it and you can, it can help you figure out ways of coping, um, in a, in a way where you can kind of relieve yourself of that tunnel vision a bit. Interesting. Switching gears a little bit. Um, you've done a lot of public speaking, TEDx talks, university talks. What are some of the common questions or what is the most common question you receive from your audience who may be struggling with anything with mental health or what's something mm -hmm. that you get quite a bit? I mean, I think once people sort of know my perspective and where I've come from in my life experience, um, a question I get often is, is how do I get out of my own way? Like, how, how do I take those first? How do I open the car door and get out of the car? Hmm. And um, for me, it was, it's, it's a few things. It is, again, finding that support system of people who will show up for you, will cheer you on. Um, regardless of what it is you're trying to do, go to the Olympics or, you know, run a, run your first 5k or it doesn't even have to be sports. It could be, you know, anything in life. Um, and that support system can be a therapist. That support system can be, you know, uh, friends and family. And I know sometimes that's complicated too, but, um, the other thing that 
I had to um, sort of get used to is that idea of failure, Mm -hmm. getting comfortable with failing because you're not always going to run, you know, run a perfect race. You're not always going to tick every box and and get everything that you ask for from the universe. So um, if you can get comfortable in a position of possibly failing, and if you can switch your focus to what can I learn from this moment, from this situation, from this opportunity that I've that is placed in front of me. If I fall flat on my face, Mm -hmm. how can I walk away from this and say, okay, well, that was horrible and embarrassing. And I fell on my face, which I have done. I have done in track meets. I have fallen flat on my face. Um, But then you say, okay, what, what opportunity for, for learning Mm -hmm. is there in that failure? And then failure becomes less of a demon and it becomes an opportunity to to grow that's an excellent point that i want to reiterate to our listeners um i think we all many people have a fear of failing myself included i I fear it all the time and i have failed yeah i have failed i've made tons of mistakes you know um i started off after finishing school as a therapist you know and now I'm, i'm running companies and i've been doing that for years now and i make lots and lots of mistakes Um, But I can tell you from my personal experiences, the way that I've become better at what I do and have become more successful at what I do is more from learning from what I've done wrong. Uh, And I know from from myself, I'm only really good at a few things. I'm not great at all (laughs) of these things. You know, I'm really bad at a lot of things. For me personally, I'm lucky. One of the things I'm good at is putting together good teams. And putting together good teams helps you run and build good companies. So that's one, right. of, luckily, one of my skill sets. But I'm bad at lots of stuff. But the times that I have fallen flat on my face, like you mentioned, um, those have been the best, most valuable lessons because I usually don't make the same mistake twice. Now, if right. you're m- failing a lot and making the same mistake over and over and over again, that's a little bit different thing. Um, but I, I, I can really totally relate to, to what you said about that. And that's interesting. That's a, that's a question you get a lot from your from your public speaking, huh? Absolutely. I mean, and also, like, you know, I agree with you. I think uh, I'm, I'm really good at a few things. <laughs> and then the <laughs> other stuff, like, I can, I can, you know, pretend to be a doctor on television. I cannot, <laughs> like, I'm, def- I'm definitely not doing open heart surgery on anybody. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I feel like, uh, If you, yeah, it's shifting your mind um, set to uh, it being a learning opportunity and a growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, And if there, if you do continue to repeat the same things, maybe it's a conversation about strategy. Take a step back for a moment. (laughs) Right. Um, One thing that we talk about a lot, and especially I talk about in our field of mental health and substance use disorder, is the topic of stigma. What are your thoughts on how we can reduce stigma around mental health issues and encourage people to seek help when they need it? I've been really happy to see more and more um, as sports figures, uh, people in the entertainment industry being open to talk about it. I think a lot of people, um, if if they can look at Michael Phelps (laughs) and say, my gosh, this, how could he possibly, and for someone that is so successful and accomplished and um, comes out and says, I needed help. I needed help. I think, um, I think as a society, we're not encouraged to, to cry uncle. I think we're kind of, um, you know, we live in a society of people who are sort of like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, put, roll up your sleeves and just get to work and muscle through. And mm-hmm. um, and I think that it does us a disservice because there are times that you do need help. And um, if we're too proud or too scared or too there's a stigma around seeking help, um, people aren't going to do it. But I, I do yeah. feel, I feel like there's been a significant shift in the last maybe 10 years, 
maybe less, maybe five years of, uh, of there being much more of a groundswell of people saying, it's okay to need help. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the most, I'm the most decorated Olympian in the world and I needed help. Yes. You know, that's that I think continuing that, but also I think, um, access to help is, is another thing that, um, especially through, oh my gosh, I mean, COVID, the, the things that we have gone through globally as human beings in the last three years of isolation, um, you know, feeling uncertain, um, fear of going outside your house early on, you know, mm-hmm. there, um, I think that has changed and shifted the way that I've heard people talk about mental health in a, in a big way, because everyone was feeling something, you know, everybody was feeling some sort of, of fear and, and isolation and, and, you know, feeling sad and lonely and things like that. So um, hopefully as a, as a culture, we're starting to see incremental change. And I think we are. I I agree with you. Um, I think there's a few things I wanted to highlight there before I forget. One is that, (laughs) Um, seeking support is not a weakness. It's a sign of strength, like you mentioned. I think that's critical mm-hmm. for our, our listeners to really understand and hear. Two, I agree also with the stigma. It's still a big problem, but um, the main reason that I do this show, this podcast, is to reduce stigma. Mm-hmm. And when I have mm-hmm. people like yourself and um, you know other people that have come on and Hollywood celebrities, athletes, you know, freely talking about their own struggles, it normalizes it. It's like right. I broke my arm. I went to the doctor. I got an x-ray. They put a cast on. Okay, good. I'm glad you got taken care of. I have depression. Oh, well, have you pulled your, have you tried just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps like you said? Right. Or here's my favorite right. one. I have severe anxiety disorder. Well, have you tried just not worrying so much? Like these are the kind of things that are not helpful to say to, say to people, right? Uh, right? Of course they've tried not to worry so much and they, they don't want to be worrying all the time. Um, and then they're worried that they're worrying so much. <laughs> the fear of fear, which is the root of all anxiety, right? Right. right. So in your experience, um, in, in your incredibly uh, fascinating life and everything you've done, what are, what are some of the more effective strategies for managing anxiety or fear, that are, uh, in, particularly in like high-pressure situations like competition? What have been your go-to? As you mentioned a few of them, but I just wanted to expand on that. I, um, my sort of my favorite, there's kind of two that I have taken with me and I'm, they're actually pretty, I think they're pretty common practice. Um, but I like them because they're sort of invisible. (laughs) I, um, either right before competing or I just was doing a show on Broadway and, um, right before I'd go on stage, I, if I was feeling anxious or, you know, whatever I would do box breathing. Mm -hmm. So I would, and it, it is, it's a grounding exercise and it, sl- it physically slows your heart rate down. Yeah. So it is, it's very simple, but it is, um, you breathe in for four, mm-hmm. the count of four, mm-hmm. you hold your breath for a count of four, you breathe out for a count of four and you leave the air out of your lungs for a count of four. And then yep. you continue and you sort of, it's called a box cause you, it's basically four steps and it is so simple and so effective to, so it physic it the it is not just like come on you can do this like a little pep talk you are you are changing your physicality you are actually physically changing the response your body is having to the anxiety that your mind is producing for yourself mm-hmm. um so i find that incredibly helpful the other um exercise that i use um and uh, the reason i say they're sort of invisible is that no one knows no one has to know you're breathing right. the way that you're breathing you could be in the middle of a party and doing box breathing Mm -hmm. and, and no one would know. Um, and then the other one is, uh, the five, it's, I call it the five things exercise. And it's when you focus on, uh, you take all of your senses. So you notice Mm -hmm. five things around you that you can see four things around you that you can touch. Um, three things that around you that you can hear two things around you that you can smell. And then one thing that you can taste. Um, And again, that is to me an exercise that when I'm spinning out or I'm, um, you know, going on a spiral of like negative self-talk or getting myself worked up, 
it basically just removes your focus from yourself and it helps you ground yourself in the world around you. And uh, it helps me sort of have a touchstone of like, nothing has changed. <laughs> like all of this anxiety and all of this, uh, the, all the ways that I'm working myself up to feel all this, these fe feelings, they're just feelings. They're not tangible. The tangible things are the desk that I'm sitting in front of and the, you know, the hum of the air conditioning that I can hear um, and those kinds of things. And it, 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 for me, it stops the spiral of negative, make negative thoughts. Yeah. And it removes you out of your, out of, you know, breaks that cycle for me. And I, again, it's something that can be done and no one has to know that you're doing it. The thing you feel could be your pant leg, mm -hmm. you know, like it could be your, um, it doesn't have to be some huge um, outward thing that you're doing. It's just sort of this secret little thing that I, those are my sort of invisible tools that yeah. I use. As a psychologist, I've taught both of those many times. I use them in my own life. And for our listeners, what, what Katie's referring to is deep breathing exercises. There's many different forms of it. Box breathing is one very common one. And the second piece of the five things that you mentioned is a grounding technique, which you which you also right. recommend. So that's interesting. So before before you're going on Broadway, huh? That's what you're doing backstage. I, uh, <laughs> absolutely, because I have to say, uh, the show that I did on Broadway recently, um, the character I was playing was, uh, I don't use, I don't sit in a wheelchair in my daily life um, most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's sort of a f much further step than like just walking outside of a car without cosmetic covers on. I was in this play without my prosthetics on at all. Mm -hmm. So my character was used, used a wheelchair and did not wear prosthetic legs. So it's sort of way more the version of like being on stage, you know, without your forgetting to wear your pants when you have to do a presentation. <laughs> it's that nightmare that people have. Um, and so I had a lot every night right before I went out, I was, I would always have some anxiety because it, it's that vulnerability. It's being naked. It's putting yourself, laying yourself bare in front of hundreds of people. And I, I, you bet I was doing box breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that mm -hmm. sometimes even when my anxiety was high, I would do the five things, you know, just to ground myself and, and stop that, whatever it was that I was gonna, that I was convinced was going to happen. Just, shh, shh, you know? Yeah. You mentioned, uh, back to sports for a minute, you mentioned yeah. that you had a, uh, a psychologist on staff and she was very helpful to you. How can sports teams and organizations work better to support the mental health of their athletes? Do you see in, in the sports world, you're much more connected to that than I will ever be. Do you see that as a kind of a regular thing these days? Do a lot of teams have that in place or is this something that's just getting started from your perspective? I, I mean, I think... Uh when I started working with her, it was, I think it was the first time that they had had a psychologist on staff traveling with the team. Um, and I, and I think it made a huge difference. So I think, I mean, you have to look at human beings as, as the whole global, you know, we're not robots. If you have, if you want to watch a bunch of robots, compete like <laughs> they're not going to have any mental health issues or concerns or anxiety <laughs> or depression but um i think the reason why sports is inspiring is that people over you know it's overcoming and yeah. it's seeing people do extraordinary things and overcoming uh, circumstances um i think that more and more organizations are making it at least available if not a priority but i think it it you have to treat the the human as a whole. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. expect someone to continue to show up and perform in a way um, if if they're having problems at home or if they've got these other anxieties or stresses or, you know, or even if it is just, um, you know, I call it spinning out, but like, even if it is you're just spinning out, like having resources and having people that also um, notice it because sometimes when you're in it, you can't, you can't point to it. 
if you're in, you know, you can't see the forest through the trees. So I think educating more um, staff, coaches, um, you know, and team doctors yeah. and things like that to think about to think about an athlete and think about uh, the person as as a whole from mind, body and spirit, you know. What uh, what have you done or what are your some of your goals on being an advocate for mental health? I, 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 the biggest thing for me is, is like you've said, stigma mm -hmm. is like having, have, being brave enough to say, I can't do this by myself. I can't, um, I need help and knowing and, and knowing when that is, which is, you know, really challenging. And I, that's where relying on your support system and relying on around, you know, the people who you trust and love around you to say, I think you know, I think this is beyond venting. Like, I think this is beyond, you know, calling my mom and venting. Like, <laughs> no, I really need somebody to, to help guide me. And, um, in that same way, like you said, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't say, you know, gosh, I broke my arm. I'm just gonna like wing it. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> you actually like take steps to, um, to take care of your, your body as a whole yeah um and i think that i think being able to say it's hard and we're constantly bombarded with uh images of you know people's highlight reels and comparing yourself to other people mm -hmm. and going sort of down the spiral of um the the way that we function in the world now is so different and we're it's it's so fast and actually being able to kind of step, take a step back, take a breath and say, I think I need some help is brave and it's hard. You know, one, one question I can, I can think of that our listeners might have is when they're hearing you say that is how to know when to get help. And my, my answer to that question for, for those of you who may be listening or wondering that about yourself is ask yourself this one question. Are the symptoms that you're dealing with, whether it's anxiety or depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD, trauma, are they negatively impacting your daily life? If the answer is yes to that one question, that is a clear indicator that it is time to seek support and get help. And the reason that so many people don't is because of again, what you said. I should just pick myself up by the bootstraps. Have you tried not being so sad? Why don't you just worry less? Right. None of that is anything that people want to do. But the main reason is that seeking support seems like a weakness in our minds, which is just another one of those distorted thoughts that lead us to inaction. And we need to challenge that distortion by telling ourselves that seeking help for problems in our lives is actually a very strong sign of strength. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the messages that you wanted to get out today. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Katie, what are your website and social media handles? How, do, how does our audience learn more about you? How can they find you if they haven't already? Yeah, my uh, my website is Katie uh, with a Y, like Katie Perry, K-A-T-Y, mm -hmm. Sullivan.net. And um, I'm on social media. Uh, I, Instagram, I'm at real, real Katie Sullivan and um, uh, on Twitter, you can just type in Katie Sullivan. You'll find me. I'm okay. I'm Googleable. So <laughs> yes, I know that for a fact. I'll, I'll, I'll find I'll find you on social media after this. Um, is there anything I would else? Love that. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say or anything I missed or anything we didn't get to chat about? I no. I think uh, this has just been um, such a gift, and I'm um, I'm glad that we're getting to a place where we can have these open conversations and not just assume that people are living their best lives all the time Yeah, because <laughs> it's not true. It's not. You're right. And, yeah. um, we've, been, we've been through a lot of stressors in, in this world and in our country over the last few years. And now with all the wars going on and the political conflicts, you know, it doesn't seem to be getting much better. So it's going to be even more crucial that we, we address the problems that we're facing. We seek support for the issues that we're dealing with and we use it, utilize each other to lift each other up um, throughout these tough times. So, Thank you so much, Katie, for being on the show You're, today. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Katie, are there any uh, specific charities that you support, or is there anywhere that our listeners can go to support some of the charities that you're involved with? 
I am a huge proponent of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, I think they do great work, and I think they do, to me, the biggest uh, piece of all of the uh, making sure that people have access is um, working with organizations that are doing that are trying to reach people who can change policy mm -hmm. in in our country and um, and supporting organizations that do that sort of promotion with with people who can actually make change. Um, I think it's really important. Um, the other organization that I uh, have very near and dear to my heart is Challenged Athletes Foundation um, because my life changed when someone yeah. handed me a pair of running blades. Um, they're an organization that uh, get, provides uh, financial help for competition. They provide you opportunities to ha get handed a pair of running blades or a, a, a you know a wheelchair that can play rugby or um, whatever it is that you need a, an assistive, the expensive assisted device yeah. to mm -hmm. unlock the potential in your life. So um, please check out Challenged Athletes Foundation. They're phenomenal. And I, I totally agree with you. I, as a former board member of NAMI, uh, I agree with everything you said about that organization. Um, really, they can they can drive change, and that's what we really need. Uh, and the second thing as well, and what, and what I learned from you is that you know that pair of sprinter blades opened up an entire new avenue for your life. Um, so supporting that organization uh, would be a great thing to do because you may very well be doing that for the next Katie Sullivan coming up the pike. For sure. Thank you again, Katie Sullivan, for taking the time to speak on Be Well today. You are helping people by ending the stigma and reducing the stigma for mental illness across America. To our audience, if you or a loved one is struggling, please contact the Be Well Network. There is help for today's life's obstacles. Until next time, I'm Dr. Bender. Be well.